Honored to open uh, the afternoon panel. Introduce yourself. I am about to do that uh, of the, the conference. Uh, my name is Dror Varman. I'm the Dean of Humanities here at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. I'm also a historian when, I'm, when I don't do the, when I'm not an administrator. Uh, this panel, new information technologies, knowledge, teaching, learning. Um, every speaker will speak for 15 minutes at which point I will make various signals and gestures to point that out. And after that, we will open uh, for discussion. The first speaker, uh, Mr. Ben Nelson, uh, is the founder of what uh, Professor Moskin just described as the most innovative university on the planet. Mm -hmm. He's the founder, chairman, and CEO of Minerva Project, which is a, a for-profit company whose goal is to provide Ivy League education at a fraction of the price uh, prior to this, he was CEO and other, served in other functions uh, in other forms of kind of new kinds of technology uh, uh, enterprises and, and uh, startups. For instance, uh, the photo hosting and printing service Snapfish, which many of us have used. Uh, he also, uh, well actually, you know, there's a list of other things that he did in competitive telecommunication services, which I will skip. He graduated from the Wharton School of, at the University of Pennsylvania. Ben, Ben, sorry. <laughs> I was paying attention. All yours. Thank you very much. Um, so going after the, the topic, I, everybody's sitting in one section of the room. So, um, so um, I, I will try to direct most of my comments in that direction. But the few of you who are sitting directly in front of me uh, are going to be easier to talk to. Um, so given the, the topic of, of the panel, I thought I would take a step back and discuss how we look at the role of technology and its impact on education and then how we designed a new institution around that idea. I think one of the things that people often forget about what makes technology revolutionary, what allows it to be transformative, is not that technology allows us to do what we're currently doing in better or more efficient ways. The technology allows us to do things that were previously not possible without technology. And that's what makes technological revolution so dramatic. It's also what makes it so dangerous from people's perspective because it brings to bear a model which existing institutions or existing models don't necessarily predict, don't necessarily think about. Um, and one of the things we try to do at Minerva is we try to encourage existing institutions in higher education to think in uh, much more radical ways about what their mission is and what they would like to do in the ideal. Oftentimes, I remember, uh, we, we have many delegations of, of universities, uh, presidents and provosts and deans, et cetera, who come to visit. And um, uh, invariably, you know, once we're done explaining what, what we're doing, they, you know, they'll say, well, you're what we want to be when we grow up. Uh, and, and we, you know, and, and it's very heartening to hear that, but in many ways they go back to their home institutions and then don't know what to do next. And so we're, I, I hope that by actually thinking more about first principles, you can, you can rethink more to the core about what the institution should be doing. So one way of, of, of looking at, at least the way that we look at the role of technology in education, is to split education really into three separate categories. And we think that the, the technology has impact on those categories in very different and very profound ways. The first category is what I think most universities have spent the last 50 years focusing on, and I think is actually what will not be the purview of universities moving forward, at least when it comes to their relationship to students. It will be the purview of universities in publishing and, and uh, in other forms, but not in the paid, quote unquote, services that they provide, and that is the dissemination of knowledge. If you go and ask most universities, what is your mission? Why do you exist? The answer is usually we are here to create and disseminate knowledge. Um, and that will continue to be the case. The only difference is, is that that creation and dissemination is going to be done largely directly from the research function. 
meaning that the research function will work on creation and dissemination will be done not only in journal publications, but will be done in ways that will distribute various levels of abstraction to students from all over the world for free. Uh, the likelihood that, and universities have, have been at the forefront of very much being against paywalls on journals and uh, in, the, in the current system, um, because there is, I think, a, a shared common belief, an ethical belief, that information should be freely transmitted. Um, and technology, obviously, makes the transmission of information much more efficient, much more effective. Um, and in fact, the science of learning, the research that's been uh, published over the last 20 or 30 years, summarized recently, by the way, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science in the United States, shows that the current method of delivery of the bulk of information, the lecture, is so ineffective, in fact, uh, about a 5 to 10 percent retention rate of what you, you are supposed to learn in a, in a lecture-based class six months after the end of that class, which is a horrifyingly low number, so much so that the, uh, that the PNAS, a PNAS uh, review concluded that if you are going to perform uh, new studies in the science of learning and you plan to use lectures as your control group, you are committing scientific misconduct. Um, it is worse than a sugar pill. Um, and, and that's, that's a, a, a stunning, stunning conclusion. And of course, technology allows you to take the very basic uh, element of, of the dissemination of knowledge of lecture and at the very least improve upon that. If you just record the lecture and you listen to a recording as opposed to listen to it live, you can at the very least pause and rewind, um, which is already an infinite improvement over, uh, over the live version. But of course, technology can do so much more than that. And of course, the ultimate uh, hope for the dissemination of knowledge is adaptive learning, uh, the concept that you not only have a static uh, amount of content that is uh, delivered to the student, but that based on how quickly the student understands a certain wave of information, a certain track, that the kind of information given to them is modified greatly. Um, and so the implication of that from our perspective is that the sum total of classes delivered today in lecture format will in the future no longer be part of a university setting. That they will effectively be free for all of humanity. And in fact, it's already beginning. You see the phenomenon of the MOOCs and, uh, and all the rest. And of course, people are very quick to, to throw stones and criticize uh, the MOOC model. And they say, oh, well, you know, look at these terrible completion rates and look at, uh, uh, at all of these problems. The problem is, is that that analysis is a false one. Um, and the reason that, uh, that the MOOCs are getting such bad press right now is actually because of the MOOC providers themselves, because they were rushing for good press early on. And so rather than actually using metrics that everybody else can follow, which were real metrics, number of students who intentionally take a class for a reason that stick with it for more than you know, registration, um, Instead, they wanted to get a lot of uh, make noise in the press, and they said, hey, we have millions and millions of users, which they never have. Uh, they have tens of thousands of users uh, on a given course, which is really fantastic. Right? It's, it's two orders of magnitude greater than you would have in, a, in, an, in an offline setting, but it's not four orders of magnitude greater, and that's what they were, uh, what they were publishing. And so the, the easy way to think about, uh, about the completion rates of MOOCs is think about, and I'm sure you all get uh, books for free all the time, friends and colleagues and people who say, oh, you know, I've just written a book here. Um, I, so is that true? Let's, let's make this a little bit more interactive. How many of you get books at random from people? Anybody? No? OK, that, that's good. Now, how many of you? How many of us give books? Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure maybe, you, maybe you give them too, yeah. <laughs> Uh, exactly. Well, the, 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 where this is going may not be a good, a good, uh, 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 a good thing for those who give them. So of, uh, of those of us who receive books, how many of us read every single book we're given cover to cover? Wow. <laughs> that's, there's one. There's one. I'm giving him, when I write my next book, that's, you're, you're, you're getting it. Um, but the fact of the matter is most people who even buy books don't finish them. Um, and it's very similar to a MOOC. I mean, it costs absolutely nothing to register. You register, you show some interest. But the fact of the matter is, if you get through a week or two of MOOCs, you do the first assignment, your completion rate is actually higher than most university course completion rates. Um, and there's no incentive to actually complete them. 
So, and, and we also have to remember that technology is at the very uh, early, early stage. And so I spend a lot of time on, on, on this part, not to say that this is actually the future of education, is that, that the future of education should be informed or potentially be informed, whether you agree with me or not, by the possibility that this is the case. And if this is the case, it has radical implications on the way that universities currently conduct their education. It means that the overwhelming majority of credits that universities issue, the universities issue will no longer be able to be issued by universities, that, un that students will f absolutely flatly refuse to spend the time and money the universities ask them to, to certify that they have read a book. Um, and so in that light, one can ask, well, what then is the role of the university with a student? What is it that the university is charged to do? And we argue that is the second bucket, second and third bucket of education. And the second bucket is the intellectual development of the student. It's the idea that, you, that it comes to the real ideal of the American university, the liberal arts education, right? Not uh, knowledge for knowledge's sake, which I actually think is a bastardization of liberal arts, has nothing to do with them. That's a separate uh, debate we can have. Um, but is the concept of the liberal arts as they were uh, originally implemented in ancient Roman times, right? Educating the polity to govern providing uh, the, those who are sovereign, and in democracies, the people are sovereign, not, uh, not the heads of state, they are our representatives, um, and uh, providing them the ability by studying the various arts, not just the humanities, but you know, mathematics, philosophy, what we know today as science, uh, crafts, what we know today as engineering. These are the elements that people need to be educated in more broadly and they need to understand how to interrogate subject matter that they are not expert in, to understand expertise because they will be able to interrogate uh, experts in other subjects by a process of rigorous intellectual development. And for that, we think that technology is incredibly important because the way that intellectual development was done when it was done by universities 60 plus years ago was by the great books curricula, right? You read your Shakespeare and Plato and, uh, and Socrates, and then you, you are able to uh, ab uh, abstract their uh, ideals and govern uh, and make decisions in the future. And while it was an, a, a fine system for the day, it's an antiquated version. We know so much more about how the brain works, about how people think, about how decisions are made, that today what we need is not a great books curriculum, but a great cognitive tools curriculum. How do we actually put together those elements of learning, those elements of decision making, and make sure that people understand them both within context of, of let's say, their primary area of focus, but also that they understand the abstraction and how to apply it to other types of contexts. You know, this, the principle of far transfer, without which you really don't have deep understanding. That requires a curriculum that is not broken down into separate independent units, what we know as the courses or the standalone courses. It requires curricula, right? And unless we reduce the amount of fields that we study to one, which is not going to be the case, nor should it, right? The only way to allow for a scaffold to run through curriculum is to introduce technology. It's to track how students progress in a given course along a common set of elements, these common cognitive tools, and how to carry them from one subject to another. And that's effectively what, what Minerva is, and we can talk about that um, in, in more detail. The last element of education seems to be the one least affected by technology, and that's uh, the concept of apprenticeship, experiential education, those things that you have to do and practice. You need to be a, a, a concert pianist or, uh, or a dentist you can't get out of playing the piano or drilling teeth. You have to practice. You have to have the ability to do that. But what technology actually enables is it enables the removal of place to receive the rest of that education. It divorces the need for, somebody to, for a student to live in a particular city to be able to get the dissemination of knowledge and intellectual development they need in order to be successful at their trade. And so it provides geographic flexibility 
for the student to be able to go and practice and learn from the world around them where it best fits. And so that is the framework that we use to build Minerva. And again, if you'd like, I'm happy to talk about it in greater detail. But it's a framework that I think is useful, at least from a futuristic or not so futuristic point of view, but from at least a scenario that your institutions may have to contend with in the future. And if that scenario does come to pass, you should ask how quickly can your institution react to that world. If it happens to pass sooner than you think, you may actually want to get your institution ready for it sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. You actually <laughs> helped for 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> that in and of itself is probably the only thing that deserves a pause. I've never ever seen that happen. I'm, I'm not sure what to do next. <laughs> what is the role of the chair at that moment? I'll help you. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you.